Today, God's got something to say to everybody. And you may say, well, Pastor, that message you in just a moment, that message isn't really for me, but it's really for the worst person sitting next to me. Can I tell you, you're going to need it down the road. You may need it tomorrow, you know, and uh, just thank you so much. And, and this coming Wednesday, I don't want you to forget, uh, we have Bible study right here. And Sister Felicia Washington brought a powerful word Wednesday. I had to be out of town at a conference. My wife was speaking, and she doesn't do good driving through Atlanta, so I was her chauffeur. <laughs> so we had a really good time at the conference in Atlanta, and as she spoke, powerful word that the Lord gave her. But also right here, Felicia Washington, did you did a powerful job. Thank you so much for bringing the word to us. Amen. Let's give God praise for that. And she did part one uh, Wednesday night, but guess what? She's coming back with part two. Y'all better bring your seatbelt with you on part two. But she's going to be speaking Wednesday night. Uh, Jen and I have to be out of town again with our son, Rhett. He's going through uh, a health crisis right now, and but he's on the road to his healing. Amen. And uh, just believe with us, as as with all of these, that God is our healer. Amen. And I didn't get much sleep last night, but guess what? I feel the strength of the Lord with me today. And uh, I just know that God's got something. Listen, when he's disrupting my home, I know he's got something to say today. <laughs> but guess what? If it's just one hour of sleep, I, I'm here today, and I'm here to give the word of the Lord. I got a busy day. I got a funeral this afternoon. I won't get home till late this evening. But let me tell you something. I feel God's help. And that's the beauty about our Lord is that when we go through things, he's right there. Amen. He's right there with us. And today I'm just going to talk to you a few minutes on the simple little topic this morning. What God touches, God changes. Ooh, he's even changed me already this morning by touching my life today. And we're going to look at a familiar passage today in Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to be in verses 1 through 4. God has given Jeremiah this object lesson of clay that we are in the potter's hand. Amen. And what God is molding and what God is shaping and what God is doing in your life is going to be incredible. Somebody say, I'm in the potter's hand. Come on, we got to let the Lord do what the Lord wants to do with our lives. Because there are things in our lives. The Bible says that the clay was marred. There was things, there were imperfections in it. And we're going to see what God does with imperfections today. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know he's talking about you too. <laughs> God, amen. Amen. All of us, somebody say all of us, we've all had these imperfections in our life and some of us still have them and we're, God is still working with us, amen? Jeremiah 18, let's read it. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Aren't you glad the Lord speaks? The Lord is speaking here and he told the servant, he said, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. Somebody say, God's making something. Ooh, and he's going to start with us today. He's going to work in our hearts today. God is up to something. He's making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. Somebody say he'll do it again. He made it again into another vessel. As it seemed good to the potter to make. Father, strengthen us today for your word. May every heart receive the word of the Lord today in your name. Amen. I want to start by saying this morning that you're not in the hands of chance. You're not in the hands of blind fate. 
you're in the hands of Almighty God. That's a good place to be in. Clay cannot mold itself. Only God has the power to properly and perfectly shape and guide and fashion your life. There is no such thing as a self-made Christian. So he shaped it, the Bible says. In other words, God is saying that he is working with it and he is not doing what seems good to the clay. Has anybody ever told God how you need your life shaped and what you want God to do in your life? But God is saying, no, I'm going to do what I need to do in your life because there are imperfections and there are things in your life that I want to get rid of and shape and mold so that you can be a vessel of honor. He did not do what the clay wanted. The potter knows what he wants to make out of the clay. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 10, for we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Somebody say, I'm going to walk in the good thing of the Lord. Amen. That's what God wants with our lives, to walk in the blessings of God, to walk in the will of God and whatever that looks like. And in this shaping process, the clay is being changed. We are in the potter's hand. What God was showing Jeremiah is that you are in my hand. My people Israel, they are in my hand. And God is taking this marred clay, the imperfections, and he is reshaping it. In other words, our character, our morals, our behavior, God is our thinking and God is reshaping it. Now morals are your right and wrongs. They are your do's and your don'ts. They are to be rooted in the word of God and not in popular culture. Your moral stand has to be taken from the word of God. Your wills and your wants must be rooted in the word of God. You need to find out, God, what is your will for my life? What is it that you want to do in my life? See, God has also anticipated all of our weaknesses. We don't like for nobody to see them, do we? Well, I got a, there's a few more amens on this side. <laughs> One over here. God already knows what your weaknesses are. They are not hidden from him. In other words, God knows in what area we are weak in. And that marred part of your life. He knows where you are most vulnerable. He knows your imperfections. And we can go through life with character deficiencies. It does not mean that you are a bad person. Morals are your do's and your don'ts. But morals are not your character. Because anytime you don't live up to your moral standard, a person of godly character, they will correct and repent of their wrongs. David was such a man. David was a man after God's own heart because he was quick to repent. And a person of high character knows that when they have messed up morally and no one has to point it out to them. A person with godly character will police themselves. People, people should not have to point out your moral deficiencies. But when you have godly character, you know when you did wrong, right? No one should ever have to point out when you got a bad attitude. No one should ever have to tell you, you can't treat people just any old way and get by with it. When you do bad all by yourself, a person with godly character are their own judge and jury. And they know this, I've got to make this right. And a person with high character is not a perfect person. But when they do wrong, they tell themselves, 
hey, I got to get this right with my brother and with my sister. And not only that, I've got to get this right with God. The Bible says that a just man may fall seven times in Proverbs 24 and 16. And may I remind everyone that is listening today, not a sinner not a carnal person, not an evil person, not a hypocrite. He's talking about a just man. Now what's the difference between a just man and an unjust man? A just man will get back up again. I said a just man will get back up again. Chances are 100% that you're going to make a mistake and even fail God at some point in your life. What do you do? When you make mistakes. What do you do? Where do you turn to? What the Lord is saying right here. A just person. A man or a woman. They will get back up again. I want to tell somebody today. You're going to get back up again. Amen. You're on the potter's wheel. God's at work in your life. You're going to get back up again. God is long-suffering, the Bible says, toward us. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you thankful that God's not willing for you to perish? He's long-suffering. God is patient with us. Now, pastor, sometimes his patience isn't always as good. How about yours? I mean, you know, we, we, we sometimes fall into that category where we have to work on patience. But let me tell you this. The Bible lets us know that the fruit of the Spirit, part of that is patience and kindness, right? And I can tell you this. If you've got the Holy Spirit, you have the capacity to be patient and long-suffering. Amen? People may give up on you. People may walk away from you. People uh, may be disappointed in you. People will not always forgive you. But God will always be with you. God will always, as as Jeremiah was seeing the potter there, God keeps his hands on you even when you're marred. Some of you, hey, some of y'all need to be praising God right now because you've been in that marred condition where the potter was moving and working in your life and reshaping your life and removing imperfections and character flaws and all kind of things from your life. Though I want to tell somebody, God will stick with you through thick and thin. What God was showing here. What God was showing Jeremiah the prophet is, I don't leave my people alone. I don't discard them and throw them away. No, I say get back up and let's try this again. Get back up and let's do this again. I've got my hands on you. I love that about God. Amen. He knew you would make mistakes. And yet he made provision for all. I I said at Easter, Jesus nailed it. I said, he nailed it for every last one of us. He knows your uh, weaknesses in life. He knows what you're going through. He knows how you're tempted. He knows the sin. He knows all about us. Amen. He knew we would make mistakes and he made provisions for every last mistake you would ever make. Just like the clay, God's got his hands on you. Can we just say that, God, you have your hands on me. He's got his hands on you. The Bible says this in Psalms 37, the steps of a good man, not a perfect man, may I remind you, are ordered by by the Lord and he delights in his way though he fall he shall not be 
utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hands there you go again God's great hand are, are upon your life. And may I say this, you may not feel the hand of God upon your life and you may not even sense the hand of God upon your life, but I will remind you today, God's word cannot lie. His hand is upon your life. For the psalmist said, I've been young and now I am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread in other words David was saying when I was young his hand was upon me when I failed him and now that I'm older his hand is still with me his hand is upon my life and guess what he's still ordering steps he is still with his people God anticipated every weakness in David's life and though he fall he will not be utterly cast down the Bible says Utterly, what does that word mean? It means completely. Meaning though you fall, you are not completely down and without help. Why? Because God has his hand upon your life. And the Lord said, I will reach down and I will uphold him. And, and I will be with him. And I will help him. You are helped today by the Lord. And you have hope today because of God's hand upon your life. And I want to tell somebody today, you need to wake up and think about that today, that his hand is upon you. When you rest, his hand is upon you. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to go this far this morning. When you sin, his hand is upon you. When you doubt him, his hand is there. When you don't acknowledge him in any area of your life, I'm telling you the hand of God is there upon your life. I know the devil's playing with you. I know the enemy is playing with your heart and with your mind today. But let me tell you something, with the hand of God upon your life, you can stand and you can overcome every attack of the enemy. He will lift you up. You are not completely down. You are upheld by the mighty hand of God. Amen? Now, there are, we're going to be tested. All of us are going to be tested. Anybody ever failed a test? Now, I know some of y'all, I got some of my brains right here, and I know you ain't never failed a test. Especially on this side right here. I know they, nobody would ever fail a test. You know, that my genius levels over here. But I, I failed a test one time because I didn't study all right, Sister Ethel. Don't make me start confessing up in here. <laughs> we have failed. And it doesn't feel good to fail, does it? Mm -mm. it? It does not feel good to fail a test. But our faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tried. You know what? When our faith is tested... And we are tried like that. It's not for God's sake. It's for your sake. It's so that you can know the weaknesses and the mar that is in our life. So that next time you're going to be stronger. Amen. I want to give you three tests that, re that reveals our character every time. Uh, the first test will show you what kind of character you have. And that is this, the temptation of power. When someone gives you power, you will find out what you're really made out of. The real you is going to show up with power. We see that, how people who have power begin to look down on other people. And they begin to care about only themselves. It's a me, 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 myself mentality. And the enemy will tempt us with power. The second temptation is the temptation of money. And I want to say this. Money and power are morally neutral. Power has no ability to corrupt you unless you let it. 
unless you're tempted, driven away of your own lust. Money has no ability to corrupt you. Money is just a medium of exchange, but it will reveal what's in the heart. I mean, we pray the blessings of the Lord over our finances every Sunday. And I've, I've seen people come into to big money. Somebody say big money. Yeah, and no little money. I mean, they came into big money. And, and they just forget God. I mean, like, they don't remember the house of the Lord. They don't remember where all that came from. Where does our blessings come from? They don't remember God in the tithe and in the offering. No, no, because this is mine. No, 10% of that belongs to God. He gave you the ability. What if, what if the Lord would have said, I want 90% you keep 10? But he's a gracious God, isn't he? Yeah. It, money is just a medium of exchange. It's us that make money bad. And, and that can be uh, morally corrupt how we perceive money and how we handle money. See, all of a sudden, people sometimes will get money and, the, and you see they become self-centered well I want this I want that and we don't see you no more in church because you always at the beach now that you got something don't see them in the house of the Lord oh I'm talking Anna this morning <laughs> yeah yeah don't remember God listen you want God to bless you and what happens with money is sometimes God reveals our heart. He allows us to get money just to show us what's within us. And then what are we going to do? When we do fall, when we do wrong, God, we repent, we go back to God, and God helps us do it all over again. Because God still wants to bless you. God still wants to provide for you. Amen. God wants to do all those wonderful things in our lives. If you're praying for God to bless you financially, be asking God to, before he blesses you that big to reveal what's in your heart. God, is there any wicked way in me? Is there anything in me? Amen. When you're loving money more than people, when you're craving power and position more than people, that means this, the clay is marred. The third temptation is sex. Are we in a morally decaying society today? I'm going to say this for everybody. Everybody here got hormones? That's right. And can I tell you, the enemy wants to take what God meant for good and turn it into evil, doesn't he? So never overestimate your strengths and underestimate your weaknesses. Amen. Most people are lured away in these three areas. Remember when the enemy comes to tempt you in any area. Character is not what you do. Character is what you are. Temptation, what is it? It is an assault on your identity. Remember this, Jesus lived for 30 years with no adversary, right? But just when he gets baptized, some of y'all got baptized just a few days ago, the heavens open and his identity is revealed. What did the, what did the Spirit say? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And Satan heard God declaring Jesus' identity. And Jesus then was led, the Bible says, into the wilderness and Satan showed up. Satan challenged Jesus' identity by saying, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And if you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down and the angels are going to catch you. Listen, when, 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 when he's telling him, Throw yourself down, what's he doing? Wanting Jesus to commit suicide. He tempts us all. There are people sitting in this audience today. Satan is saying some of the same things to you. But can I tell you, you're in the hands of the Father. I said you're in the hands of God. 
And he tempts him again and says, if you're the son of God, bow down. In other words, he wanted him to worship him. Can I tell you, there are things in life that Satan puts before us. He wants us to worship it. He wants us to put that first in our lives. Like our careers. We don't look at that as, oh, I got to work. Oh, I got to do that. Let me tell you something. Put God first. Somebody say first. When you put God first in every area of your life, he said all of these things will be added unto you. All of these things. Satan did not come against what Jesus was doing. He came against who his father said he was. Satan attacked his identity. Can I tell you what he's doing with us? He is attacking identity. I am not an it. Amen? I'm not a thing. I am a man. I am a he. I identify that as a he. There are two, he and she. Amen. Identity, we can see that all across America today, all across the world, identity is being attacked. So whenever you're being attacked, it's not about the thing you are doing. Satan is trying to take down your identity through that temptation, trying to get you to believe that he is the author of your life, that he knows your true identity. You have to know what Christ says about you. Is he, he's he tempting? Yes, he is. Satan wants us to bow down to the wrong identity. Scripture says temptation comes to everybody. So remember, you're never alone in temptation. You are upheld by the mighty hand of God. And I want to say this this morning. If you fall, get back up again the hands of the Lord are upon your life and he also said this you must resist somebody say resist you resist the devil if you keep resisting him you keep telling him absolutely not no I'm not going to do that you keep resisting him the Bible says he will flee from you Oh, but he'll come back with another temptation. Because what he's doing, he's trying to discover your weaknesses in your life. But if you fall, get back up because you have an identity this morning. I want to remind you, you are a child of God. You are sons and daughters of God. You're not it and 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 thing and whatever. You are sons and daughters of God. That's exactly what the Bible says. And that is why we are being tempted today because of our true identity. In Jeremiah 18, the scripture we started out with, Israel has experienced great failure. God told Israel, I want you to be a light to the nations. He said, I want you to be my example to the people. I want you to be my example to the world. I want the nations to watch you, and as they watch you serve me, and I bless you, and I'm with you, they're going to see me with you. They're going to turn their hearts to me. I want you to serve me like that. I want them to see how I bless you, how I lead you, a cloud by day, a fire by night night I make ways where there seems to be no way I am your God and I want you to honor me he says I want the nations of the world to turn to me because they see your example and Israel miserably failed to be that example that is why God took Jeremiah down to the potter's house to give him a visual picture to show him God's heart toward people who have failed him this is the hand of God. This is the love and the mercy and the grace of God that we are seeing extended. The potter did not take the clay and cast it down and throw it away. The potter put the clay back up on the wheel and he said, we're going to do this one more time. We're going to do this again. In times of character failure, Satan made a fatal mistake. In your failure, 
Satan lets you know where your weaknesses are. And that's important. Everybody in this room, you need to know where you're weak. You need to know the weaknesses that's within you. So that when the enemy comes knocking, he may be wearing blue jeans like the old song says. He may come in looking good, looking strong. Listen, the enemy knows our weaknesses. But now you are armed and you are dangerous to the enemy because Satan has revealed where you are weak at. And that is not bad altogether because now you know where you have to guard your heart. Now you know what you must do because in our weakness, he is strong. Because we know our weakness. We, we read where Paul declared his weakness. Paul said, in my weakness he is strong. In other words, I will give glory to God for his power is upon me. What is that? He is saying that God's hand is upon my life even in my weakness. He has upheld me. Paul said, I know I may look like a fool for glorifying God in my weakness. But I am so thankful that this man who wrote uh, most of the New Testament is declaring Yes, I have a weakness and I want you to know that God has strengthened me even in my weakness. Weakness did not destroy Paul. It made him more determined to lean upon God. Can I tell you, in every area of weakness in your life, you must be more and more determined that, Lord, i got to lean upon you. God, i got to have you. In my life, God, I need you in the morning when I get up until I lay my head to rest. And God, while I'm resting, watch over me. Amen. Guard my heart, guard, guard my mind. What did it do for Paul? It made him love God all the more. It made him be more and more devoted to Christ. It made him trust God more. Can I tell you everything that you're going through and, and, and the young people that are sitting here this morning and, and those that will be listening online, I want to remind you God's hands on you. You are being tempted more than you've ever been in your life. Shoot, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet. Raise your hand if you did not have the internet growing up. Lord Jesus, y'all old. <laughs> Amen. But Paul, his true identity, he said, is in Christ. And that's where you're going to have to find your identity. What happens when a manufacturer finds out that their product has a flaw in it? What do they do? They do a recall. They issue a recall. What is a recall? A recall means I'm going to take you out of use for a little while and I'm going to correct the flaw that is in you so that the next time that you are being used, you won't have the same problem anymore. That, that won't be an issue anymore in your life. And what God is saying, I'm putting you back on the wheel and I've got my hands on your life and I'm shaping you and I'm taking those marred places out so I've got you on recall right now. But there will be a time I'm going to put you back in use and in your purpose, in your true identity, where you're going to be useful. You're going to be a testimony. You're going to be a powerhouse. The enemy is not going to be able to take you down and destroy you. That's exactly what he wants to do. Because he's going to take us out of you. The manufacturer, what is I'm saying? I'm saying God is taking care of the issues in your life. Oh, somebody needs to thank God for that. Anybody got issues? The rest of y'all lying. <laughs> Amen. What he's saying is here, Paul is saying that God did a recall in my life. What happens when we don't respond to the Lord correctly in the way we should? He says, recall. When we fail into sin and temptation, he says, recall. When we have character issues and flaws, recall. We need to thank God for recalls. Amen. Because only God can fix it. Only God can correct it. Amen. Aren't you thankful that he didn't just utterly cast us away when we messed up? 
when we didn't get it right? What is God saying? God issues a recall. In other words, God said, I'm calling you back to the word. I'm going to shape the word in you. I'm, you're going to be so much stronger than you've ever been. As we get ready to close this morning, the Lord is saying, I'm calling you back to prayer. Come on, you can't neg neglect talking to God. And in that prayer time, he's going to be shaping you. You're on the potter's wheel. Calling you back to full-hearted devotion. Calling you back to worship. Calling you to be at peace. He doesn't want you to go through life miserable. He doesn't want you to go through life doubting him at every turn. But he's got you on the wheel. And he is shaping you. He is molding you. And I'm going to tell you, let God do what God needs to do in your life. There's only one person that can take you off that wheel, and that's you. Uh-uh, God, nope. But if you'll just stay there, you're going to come out a vessel of honor. You're going to come through like gold. Amen? A vessel that can be used mightily of God. Amen? He's taken what's been marred. And he's going to make it better than it was before. I love that. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm going to be better. Just come up, say, come next Sunday, and you'll see what a week with God will do. What a moment with God will do. What an hour will, with God would do. Being on that wheel is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Amen. He takes what's marred and he's making it better than it was before. Would you stand up with me all over this house? This time, it's going to be different. What God is doing in your life, enemy will regret the day he ever laid his hand on you. You're in the hands of the potter. You're in the hands of the Almighty God. What a great place to be. No better place than being in the hands of the Lord. What am I saying? I'm saying that our lives are being shaped. They're being molded. They're being formed. They're being created to be pleasing and useful to the Lord. That's what we all must desire this morning. Amen. The potter did not discard the clay. Notice this. He worked with it. I love that. He's working with us. He's not going to discard a one of us. Somebody say, he's working with me. He didn't discard it. No, he's working with us. What, is it, what does that mean? That means this. He's got his hands on us. Woo. Some of y'all, when you want to do wrong, you're going to feel the hand of the Lord on you this week. <laughs> when you get ready to have that bad attitude, I better look on this side. Oh, <laughs> I know I'll look in the camera. Maybe it's somebody there. When, when we get ready to tell that lie, not today, Satan. Uh-uh, he's taking that out of me. You hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when that comes walking by, Trying to take that second look. Mm -mm. He taking that. Come on, man. Don't. No. He going to take that. And know, God, I'm devoted to you. 
And these eyes don't need to see nothing you're not pleased with. These eyes don't need to follow nothing that you're not pleased with. I'm talking to the women too. Amen. Turn your eyes to your true love. And the Lord have blessed that. I said the hand of the Lord will be on that. You want the hand of God on your life. And I'm going to tell you what the enemy's doing. He's got us by the hand and just leading us anywhere and do everything we want. Let me tell you something. But when the God's got his hands on your life, you say, Lord, don't take me off of that wheel. Lord, give me your heart. Give me your thoughts. Give me your will. God, do whatever you want to do in my life. And can I tell all the young people, if you need to come off of social media, it's okay. It's okay. As a parent, I told my kids, maybe you need to come off of that for a while. I was on Instagram. I was on, what I was I on? I, and I just thought as a pastor, I just need to be on all those things. because, And I just like, I just can't keep up with that. And we need to be accountable. One day on my phone, something pops up on my phone and it just said, oh, look at this and whatever. And I was standing with my wife. She was nearby. And I tapped it and it was pornography. And I said, the devil, you are a lie. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to expose you right now to my wife. So I took my phone and I said, look at this. And she said, do you know that came to my phone as well? I said, well, let me talk to my kids. Because if it came to me, it could come to you. Kids, let me tell y'all. You got to turn that mess off. You can't keep going to that. The enemy that is a foothold is for men and women. Young people. And, and if you need to come off of that come off of it nobody's going to judge you for that you ain't got to show people your new shoes or your sexy self oh am I going there with everybody it's time to say Jesus put your hands on my life Jesus I need your help we're losing our identity. We're losing our identity as people of God. And the enemy is marring us, marring us. And Jesus said, if you'll just stay right there and let me put my hands on your life, I will make something wonderful of you. Don't feel like you got to go with the culture. It's going to hell in a handbasket, I can tell you. After a while, you ain't, am I being honest? Too honest? But let me tell you something. Our kids are being destroyed. How many counseling sessions have we been in? How many prayer meetings? How many times have I stayed up at night? crying and praying over people uh, let me tell you something the enemy I rebuke him in the name of Jesus right now resist the enemy resist him in your life husband you need to stay wife you need to stay committed and you need to pray for your husband my God, get the Crisco out and anoint each other on the head. <laughs> if you need to go anoint your bed, go anoint your bed. If you need to go lay across, what am I saying? If you need to go to your children's room and lay across their bed and anoint their bed. Oh no, that's their sacred space. I can't dare go in there. The devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. The devil's going all up in there when you won't. But I can tell you this, you better go in there and you better pray and you better lay across that bed and you better anoint that bed or it's going to bring so much pain and misery in your life and you're going to be calling me. But you more than that, you better call on God. You better let your children hear you talk to God. You better let them know there is but one God. And they need to know their identity. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> the, the devil don't play. I said he don't play, but God don't play either. <laughs> Ooh, I said God don't play either. He's got his hands on it. He's got his hands on your children. You young kids right here, you young guys, man, y'all look good. Yeah, you, all oh, you guys, and you ladies, young people, trust God. Yes. Keep showing up to church. I know it ain't the cool thing to do. The cool thing is to hang out all Saturday night. That's a trick of the enemy. So you can't even, want any, don't even want to go to church. But parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, pastors and leaders, we got to pray for one another. Our families are going through some of the toughest times of their life. And the enemy has come to steal from you, to kill and destroy. But I love what Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I can tell you, Jesus is here. He's got his hands on somebody, somebody. Ooh, he's got his hands on the situation. He's got his hands on the situation. He's got his hands on your grandbabies. I know, I know I've seen what God's done. I've had God to wake me up in the middle of the night when I know my kids weren't doing right. You act like, oh, no, my kids are not angels. And I'm not their best friend. I am their parent. Amen. Let's not get all that confused. But I want you to know one thing. I tell them all the time. You may do wrong. You may not do what's right. But I want to tell you this. God's hand is on your life. I said God's hand is on your life. You need to tell your children. They may go away from God. But the Bible says there will come a day. There will come a time. There is a timeline with God. They will remember what you said. They will remember this road. You are laying foundations, the Bible says, for generations to come. Your children and your grandchildren. Woo. Somebody say, Satan, take your hands off my family. In the name of Jesus, take your hands off of my family. Take your hands off of their minds. Oh, take your hands off of their finances. Take your hands off of their health. I mean, as a family, we need to start resisting the devil. That whatever will be, will be philosophy, don't get it with God. It's what you confess. It's what you believe. It's what you stand for. <laughs> the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord is going to come to you. And his hand is upon your life. Amen. I don't want to give the enemy glory, but not a, not a thing. The one thing I want to do with my life is make the enemy regret the day he ever tried to touch my family. And this church, amen. Be strong in the Lord. Don't be afraid. The enemy cannot do anything to you. All he can do is lie and try to deceive you. Be strong. Be a strong parent. Stand your ground in the Word of God. Amen. But most of all, be a loving parent. Amen. Don't go in there with I told you so when they messed up. No. Go in there with I love you. And we're going to get back up. Hallelujah. 
I feel God's hand on us, church. Father, thank you. Can we just worship one minute before we leave? We lift our hands. And I believe. I will see it. And I will see. I'm going to see your goodness, Lord. The goodness of the Lord. I'm confident as seasons change. Your faithfulness remains. One more time. someone here you say you know pastor I want to rededicate my heart to the Lord maybe there's a young person here I want to give my heart to the Lord today pastor I want to be in the hands of the potter I want my life I want him to shape and mold my life if that's you this morning or if you need prayer in any area I just want you to step down here we have prayer teams this morning we'll be glad to pray with you today I just don't like to I don't want us to leave the house today we can agree with you in prayer and believe with you. Is there anybody here this morning? Don't be ashamed. 